a very warm welcome to all of you, lovers of history and New York City, who are gathered today to honor and celebrate. Can you talk a little bit louder? To honor and celebrate the life and work of Lincoln Kirstein, co-founder of the New York City Ballet, a complex man of many parts and contributions. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel, chair of the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center and the New York City Landmarks 50 Alliance a committee of 107 distinguished and dedicated individuals and organizations committed to informing the public about the past, present, and future of historic preservation in our city. <coughs> Excuse me. Our thanks to Deborah Burchard, the project director, to Frampton Tolbert, the historic deputy director of the Historic Districts Council, who assisted with all the approvals and installation, thank you, and to George Sewell, our host, the owner of this very fine house, and the prize-winning director, producer, and current owner of this former residence of Lincoln Kirstein. Lincoln Kirstein's passion for dance started when he saw a performance of the legendary prima ballerina Anna Pavlova at the age of 12. As a young man of 25, after studying at Harvard, he had a fortuitous encounter, I guess in the lucky and accidental sense, with George Balanchine in London. It led to a lifelong partnership, a partnership that helped to realize their shared vision, the creation of an American ballet tradition. Today, Kirsten and ba together, Kirsten and Balanchine established the School of American Ballet in 1934, with Kirsten as its president and Balanchine as its artistic director. Their permanent company, founded in 1948, became the resident company of the New York City Center of Music and Drama, known as New York City Ballet. Kirstein was the company's general director until 1989. A scholar, connoisseur, and amateur art historian, Kirstein was also a veteran of Patton's Third Army during World War II. He was assigned to the Arts, Monuments, and Archives program of the Allied Armies to safeguard historic and cultural monuments and to find and return works of art that had been stolen or hidden for safekeeping. A prolific and creative writer, he was the author of more than 500 books, articles, poems, and monographs. <clears throat> Interested in modernism in every media form, in 1928, together with John Walker III and Edward M. M. Warburg, Kirstein founded the Harvard Society for Contemporary Art, the organization which led, thank you, the following year to the founding of the Museum of Modern Art. And it was at Harvard, too, that Kirstein met Philip Johnson, who became a lifelong friend and eventually the architect of the New York State Theater at Lincoln Center, New York, City's New York City Ballet's home since 1964. In 1940, Kirstein established the Dance Archives of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, excuse me, which formed the basis of the New York Public Library Dance Collection. The creator of the magazine Dance Index, he served as its editor from 1942 to 1948. His lifelong dedication has not been forgotten by future generations of choreographers, dancers, scholars, and dance devotees, as well as lovers of art. And now we will begin our program 
of distinguished speakers. First, I'd like to introduce our host and the owner of this fine residence, award-winning playwright, producer, and director George C. Wolfe, first came to national attention, or at least to my attention, with his 1991 musical, Jelly's Last Jam, about jazz musician Jelly Roll Morton. Two years later, he directed Tony Kushner's groundbreaking, Pulitzer Prize winning play, Angel in, Angels in America, and won his first Tony Award. From 1993 to 2004, he was artistic director and producer of the New York Shakespeare Festival Public Theater. That is a very long run. <clears throat> In 1996, he created the musical Bring In De Noise, Bring In De Funk with Savian Glover and won a second Tony Award for direction. He has continued his outstanding work as a director on Broadway, most recently with Lucky Guy starring Tom Hanks and in film with the soon to be released You're Not You with Hilary Swank. It is a pleasure to introduce you to George C. Wolfe. Hi everyone, I have a big voice so I will talk very loud. Um, I, I used to live, I lived on 95th Street for 9,000 years and then I became the producer of the public. I moved downtown to a place on King Street which was a hateful place to live. <laughs> Every single thing horrible that could happen happened in that house. I kid you not, including a fire while I was there. So I went, I have to get out of here. And so I, 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 I left that place and I started looking for a home and I looked for a year. I literally looked for a year. And this one wasn't quite right. This one wasn't this, this one wasn't that, this one wasn't that. And then I remember the day that I, my, my, my realtor called me up and said, okay, we, there's a place on 19th Street. And, I, and, and just before I left, the, the, my, my assistant at the time said, you're going to find the place today. And I walked down the street, and I came here, and I went, oh my God. And then I walked inside, I went, oh my God. And then I walked over the place, I went, oh my God. And then I found out it was Lincoln's place, and I went, oh my God. <laughs> and then to top it all off, his brother was named George, and when he went to see the ballet when he was 12, his cousin, Nate Wolf, who the family called that sissy, Nate Wolf, was Wolf, W-O-L-F-E. So I believe, I had the fire, <laughs> I believe every single thing that happened with the horrible place down on King Street was because it delivered me to this extraordinary house where I have been for 15 years and it's been a wonderfully creative, you know, enriching home. And when I first got here, word that the art was still here, but <laughs> The only thing that was left were these humongous shoes. <laughs> he, I mean, it was just like, you could ride in them. And so it's a very large, mm. clearly a very large foot and a very large presence and an extraordinary man. And every day that I wake up here, I feel thrilled and humbled that I can call this my home because it was Lincoln's home. Mm. And I'm glad everybody is here and I'm so sorry it's very cold. Okay. <laughs> Michelle Elligott is the Rona Rube Senior Museum Archivist of the Museum of Modern Art. She's been a Fulbright Senior Scholar and columnist for the New York Moment and columnist for Esopus, a contributor to Art Forum, Le Monde Magazine, and numerous journals and catalogs. Ms. Elligott has lectured widely, both here and abroad, and is the co-editor of Art in Our Time, a chronicle of the Museum of Modern Art today, and also the curator of the accompanying special exhibition that was shown at Rock Rockefeller Center, Michelle Elligott. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. Well, Lincoln Kirstein's uniquely important role in the history of dance in America is well known and cherished. Kirstein also, for a time, played a pivotal role in the history of modern art. His interest in the visual arts stemmed from his involvement, as was previously mentioned, with the Harvard Society of Contemporary Art and the Journal of Hound and Horn, both of which he co-founded and were the nuclei for those interested in modern art 
Individuals such as Alfred Barr, Jerry Abbott, and Eddie Warburg, who later founded and instituted the program of the Museum of Modern Art. After Kirstein gra graduated and moved to New York, Barr invited him to work on several projects. In 1930, the museum created an advisory committee, a sort of junior board of trustees, if you will, and Kirstein was one of the founding members. Two years later, Kirstein organized for the museum an exhibition titled Murals by American Painters and Photographers, which, including work by 65 artists, was the first exhibition to include the medium of photography. Now, this was a very important show, and furthermore, it was controversial. The show was, in fact, nearly censored, as it included several works, such as one by Hugo Gellert, titled Us Fellas Gotta Stick Together, Al Capone, and the museum trustees found these works to be communistic. <laughs> the show was only allowed to open after Nelson Rockefeller, then the head of the advisory committee, obtained last minute approval from both his father and from J.P. Morgan, who were depicted in this painting alongside Al Capone, who was crouching behind bags of money and wielding a machine gun. And mind you, this was one year before the Rockefeller Center incident uh, with the Diego Rivera uh, murals. Which, by the way, just in preparation for this, I learned that Kirstein was actually a model for Rivera for one of the figures in the mural. Wow. In 1933, Kirstein donated to the museum an important trove of photographs by Walker Evans of American Victorian architecture. This was his most important donation, and overall he gave the museum nearly 600 works of art. A few years later, the director of the museum, Alfred Barr, enlisted Kirsten to curate the 1938 exhibition Walker Evans American Photographs, which was the museum's first attempt to give the full range of a single photographer's work. It was accompanied by a landmark publication. This groundbreaking show and accompanying catalog were of such high scholarly importance that the museum decided to restage it to mark its 75th anniversary. And this celebration is on view today at MoMA, and so I urge you to go see that. You can see Kirstein's work on the walls. The museum was not just a beneficiary of Kirstein's knowledge of modern art, but also his expertise in the field of dance. As we know, Kirstein donated to the museum his dance archives, uh, comprised of books, photos, slides, etc. By 1944, this collection was promoted and became an independent curatorial department at the museum titled the Department of Dance and Theater Design, responsible for organizing exhibitions such as Anna Pavlova, Memorial Exhibition, Isadora Duncan, Modern American Dance, and From Sketch to Stage. Kirsten was also very involved with the museum's Inter-American Fund, which was created in 1942 with an anonymous donation from Nelson Rock Rockefeller. As our consultant on Latin American art, Kirstein was assigned for five months to travel throughout South America to Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Uruguay to purchase works for the museum. By 1943, the museum uh, included at least 300 works from um, artists from these countries. But I have to tell you, by 1946, the honeymoon was over. That year, Kirstein published an article in Harper's Magazine titled The State of Modern Painting. In it, he defined a new kind of opposition to abstract painting, and he particularly noted his distaste for, quote, improvisation as method, deformation, deformation as a formula, and painting as amusement. His loyalties rested with artists who largely explored the human figure, such as Elie Nadelman, Gaston Lachaise, Chalichev, Paul Cadmus, and George Platt Lyons. In the 1970s, he went so far as to state that the museum was, quote, the greatest promulgator of trash in history. <laughs> That's okay. We forgive him. And we salute his great contributions, which are palpable in the institution today, from the Walker Evans show currently on view, to the permeation of Latin American art and all we do, right down to the museum's newfound love affair with performance and dance. Thank you. Thank you for that very important chapter that describes the genesis and the evolution. It's now my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Homans, the author of the widely admired Apollo's Angels, a history of ballet, described by the New York Times, quote, as the only truly definitive history of ballet. 
named one of the top 10 books of the year by the New York Times Book Review. It was nominated for a National Books Critic Circle Award. Now a distinguished scholar in residence and the founding director of the New York University Center for Ballet and the Arts. Before becoming a writer, Miss Homans was a professional dancer who trained at the North Carolina School of the Arts and the School of American Ballet. She has performed with the Pacific Northwest Ballet and taught at Barnard College. She is currently engaged in writing a new book about, of course, George Balanchine and a history, thank you, which will be published when? In the near future. Her works require a great deal of research and thought, but they're worth waiting for. Thank you, Jennifer. I am so honored to be here. For me, Lincoln Kirstein was a dark, hulking figure in the back of the School of American Ballet classroom when I was a young dancer. And I had a sense, even then, that he was somehow a weighty and important figure. But of course, it wasn't until I later read his work that I understood how much he had changed the landscape of culture in the United States. Now, I want to tell you something about this house, which some of you will know, which is that in 1960, this house was mortgaged by Lincoln Kirstein. And it wasn't the only house that was mortgaged. His colleague, Betty Cage, mortgaged her country house. Their colleague, Eddie Bigelow, mortgaged his country house. And the reason that they all three did this was to finance the ballet figure in the carpet, which was an expensive and lavish affair and would not have gone on had they not done this. And what this tells me is something very important about Lincoln's approach to art. And I think he, one of the principles that he stood on was a kind of selflessness in art. He did not, he loved ballet because it was an art form that was not, he thought, about ego, but about how we could dissolve the ego, get away from ourselves, and show something important. The reason, I think, that he denied abstraction, called it an admission of failed skill in painting, was he may have been wrong about that, but I think the reason is that he wanted an art form that he felt had a long tradition and a sense that it would last beyond the lives of the artist doing it. And he felt that abstraction was simply a personal expression. He felt the same way about Martha Graham, whose work he famously described as a cross between shitting and belching. <laughs> and he said that, I think, because he felt that Martha's work would not last, outlast Martha. Balanchine was different. Balanchine was, for him, eternal, universal, and something that was beyond the self. I just wanted to read to you a brief uh, excerpt from the now famous 16-page letter that he wrote to Chick Austin, begging for financial support to bring Balanchine to the United States in 1933, because I think it shows some of the selflessness that he brought to the arts at the time. He said, and I'm quoting directly, this is the most important letter I will ever write you. My pen burns my hand as I write words. The words will not flow into the ink fast enough. We have a real chance to have an American ballet within three years' time. When I say ballet, I mean a trained company of young dancers, not Russians, but Americans with Russian stars to start with. We have the future in our hands. For Christ's sweet sake, let's honor it. And then he went on, which is less well known, to describe Balanchine's plan to establish a school, and again I quote, with four white girls and four white boys, about 16 years old, and eight the same Negroes, he said. Balanchine, he explained, wanted to have blacks in the school because of their combination of suppleness and sense of time. They have so much abandon and discipline, he said. It would be a free school, no charge. 
This school, Lincoln went on, can be the basis of a national culture as intense as the great Russian Renaissance of Diaghilev. We must start small, but imagine it. We are exactly as if we were in 1910. Please, please, Chick, if you have any love for anything we both adore, rack your brains and try to make all of this come true. It will mean a life work to all of us. And of course, so it did, and much of it happened in this house. So I'm in awe as I stand before your house <laughs> and Lincoln's His house. house. <laughs> Lincoln's house. Yes. Thank you, Jennifer. And now, to, there, we have many distinguished guests here today. I acknowledge you all with appreciation, including a former ballerina, distinguished professors and connoisseurs of theater and art. Now we will introduce the legendary ballerina and muse of Georges Balanchine and artist Joseph Cornell. Allegra Kent started studying ballet at the age of 11. At 14, she came to New York as a scholarship student at the School of American Ballet, and the following year joined the New York City Ballet, where she danced for 30 years. Her intellect, talent, and personal qualities led George Balanchine to create many leading roles for her, and led Joseph Cornell to include her image in several of his boxes and collages. She is associated especially with the title role in La Sonnambula, which she first danced in the 1960s revival of the ballet. Currently a teacher at Barnard College, she is the author of Once a Dancer, her autobiography. And she has published a book for children, The Ballerina Swan, that is now being performed by a theatrical company called Making Books Sing, Allegra Kent. Hello, all right, I, I have to bring myself into this story, uh, although I would like just to talk about Lincoln, but I, my mother placed me in a boarding school when I was nine, and I had never seen a ballet, a ballerina, nothing because it was just after World War II and um, maybe you might say we didn't have a lot of money, a lot of money. So anyway, I was in this boarding school and I suddenly wanted to dance and my mother took me out when I was 11. And, hi Jacques, and I'll, I'll make it short. <laughs> so 11, she decided to take me to the studio of Bronislava Nijinska, we all know that name. And of course, Lincoln did that amazing book on the Zimpki. So uh, they didn't have the beginners class. So my mother said, oh, so I put her in the advanced beginners or the, midi the um, you know, some really high level. So I took the class the first day. I didn't know anything. And I said, mom, take me to the library. So I went to the ballet section of the library and I said, Oh, here's the very book I need. I think it was called Ballet Alphabet, is that correct? Yes, Nancy is the, you know, wrote so many great books, ballet and repertory. Is that the right title? Repertory Yeah, so you should read it just in case you have it. And so I thought, oh my gosh, this is, I want to learn the names of the steps. It says ABC on the cover. That's exactly what I need to know. So I started thumbing through it, and I thought, gee, this isn't a kid's book. Uh, so it wasn't, but I took it out anyway, and um, I didn't really learn the plies, the jetés, and all the other things. But and then my mother, who liked to travel, decided to go east, and she heard of the School of American Ballet, got a scholarship. I was introduced, uh, Bounty took me into the company at 15, and I saw Lincoln, very high. He never saw me, because he was so determined in his profile and progress of walking. So he didn't really notice me. I was so short, and he was so tall. He didn't notice me 
until Balanchine created the unanswered question for me, and then I was taller than he was. <laughs> Why? Because four men held me up the whole time. So, oh, at last, I'm taller than Lincoln, but that was part time. Uh, Balanchine did another ballet revival that Lincoln had seen in Paris and said it was a landmark, a landmark in dance or theater or it was uh, the seven deadly sins, not six, not eight, but seven. And um, so he said, and Lottie Lenya, of course, yay for her and Brecht and everything else. So, and the music, Kurt Vile. So 1950 something or other, maybe 58, uh, Banshee decided to revive that for me and Lottie Lenya was there and um, so rehearsed, was getting ready, and I said to Lincoln, Lincoln, what kind of makeup should I wear? And he said, very little. So I thought, oh my gosh, today they would say, oh, go consult Madame Revlon or Mac or, you know, I, I think I'm the first person who ever consulted Lincoln on makeup. <laughs> And I know Jacques is freezing. I'll get off. Uh, OK, one more thing. So when I started the ballet, oh my god, you know, Jacques is going to pull me off stage. The opposite of seething. <laughs> seething is you and your hot bubbly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, OK, so actually, I asked Lincoln about one thing, because, um, well, I was in class with GIs when I started in California. So of course, I, you covered the art section of his, you know, while I was in the army. But also, he told me that he had KP in the, in the army. We all know what KP is, right? No. Kitchen police. So he told me that instead he was making lemonade and he saw these little white granules and he put it in the lemonade. And he said, it had a dramatic effect. What do you think the little white granules were? Sugar. Salt. Salt! Salt! Salt. 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 <laughs> OK, so that's, OK. Now, make a book. OK. Every book I read, it seemed, almost every book that was a biography, I would look in the people that you know were thanked for information. And so I read a book on T. E. Lawrence Lincoln. There was his name. I read a book on Eugene O'Neill. There was his name. So before I free Jacques out, I'm so glad I'm not following Jacques. <laughs> Come on, Jacques. I'm going back inside. Yay for Jacques. Well, yay for Allegra. Thank you very much, Allegra Kent. And she's quite right, Jacques D'Amboise recognized as one of the finest classical dancers of our time is our very next speaker. In 1976, while still a dancer with New York City Ballet, he founded the National Dance Institute. How many of you have been to those programs? Yes. Well, if you haven't, yes. you should go. It is one of the miracles of the modern age. Yes. And it is an exemplary program that has reached over two million school children, not to mention policemen, nuns, and every manner of being, exposing them to the magic and discipline of dance. His unique contribution, thank you, contri uh, to arts education was documented in the PBS 1984 film he makes me feel like dancing. He does that to everybody. Has, he has earned numerous awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship, Kennedy Center Honors, and the National Medal of the Arts. He's take, they have, he has traveled all over the world, from Siberia to Ethiopia, to Nepal, to Chile, and beyond. He began his ballet training at the age of seven, joined the School of American Ballet one year later, 
and studied with George Balanchine. At the age of 12, he performed with the Ballet Society, the immediate precursor of the New York City Ballet. And three years later, he joined the New York City Ballet. He has had more works choreographed for him by Balanchine than any other dancer and is renowned for his portrayal of the definitive Apollo. A choreographer in his own right, his credits include almost 20 works commissioned for the New York City Ballet. He is also a member of the New York City Landmarks 50 Alliance, and I'm very proud to welcome Jacques D'Amboise. I say to Ketty Melzin Rouge, what's your favorite city? She says Paris and New York. Oh, Alina Romanones, your favorite city? Madrid and New York. Haruko, oh, Tokyo and New York. A New York state of mind. <laughs> Billy Joel. New York, if you make it here, you can make it anywhere, New York. Will we be able to hold this crown as the global city and lose, will we lose it 10 years, 20 years from now to Shanghai? I don't know. But part of the reason everybody wants to come to New York where the arts are. And that was Lincoln, who had this incredible dream of being the czar of all the arts. Literature, poetry, architecture, design, ballet, opera, musical theater, and so on. And then he hooked up with Balanchine, thinking that he would bring Balanchine and ride his coattails. Instead, Balanchine was Mount Everest, and Lincoln had Mount Everest on his doorstep. And he had the wisdom to spend the rest of his life supporting Balanchine, to becoming a public relation person and fundraiser so that George Balanchine could have New York City as its home. So having the preservation, this wonderful thing that uh, recognizes New York City as being the place where the arts are, is a terrific thing. And I love it that we have this sign. And that living here now is George, <laughs> who's another person devoting Frampton. his life to the art of theater, <laughs> storytelling, on the highest scale of art. Let's hope that this building will continue to flower with artists. And thank you so much for asking me to be here. Pleasure, John. And at the last thing I'll say is I asked Balanchine, who is the best ballerina of all, the most talented? Is it Tamanova, Baranova, Susan Farrell, Maria Tallchief, so on top? He said, Allegra Kent. Oh. And I said, why? And he said, she has in a formula, first, in the formula, you put in the beaker energy, because without that, there's nothing. <laughs> then you put humility, but not too much, that you say, I'm not ready yet, I'm not ready yet. Oh, you put pride, but not too much. I don't do matinees. <laughs> no, you have to have the right thing, and she has it all, except one thing. What's that? She doesn't dance enough. <laughs> What a compliment, Balanchine. What about Allegra Kent? She just doesn't dance enough. Right? Anyway, so let's go inside. Could we do one thing before we do? Firstly, will you agree that Jacques D'Amboise has it all? Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. We invite you to join in sending your nominations. No phantom sites, provable evidence, we need more of them and we need your help. And now Frampton Tolbert, who is so helpful and the Deputy Director of the Historic Districts Council and a bit frozen, will read the text. Drum roll. <laughs> 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 okay.
Lincoln Kirstein, May 4th, 1907 to January 5th, 1996, 128 East 19th Street, Manhattan. Lincoln Kirstein is widely recognized as one of the founders of the American Ballet tradition. With George Balanchine, he created the School of American Ballet in 1934 and served as its president until 1989. Beginning in 1935, he attempted to launch four different ballet companies before successfully establishing the New York City Ballet of Balanchine in 1948. Kirstein was the company's general director for over 40 years until 1989. A supporter of modernism across the arts, in 1928, Kirstein co-founded with John Walker III and Edward M. M. Warburg the Harvard Society for Contemporary Art. This group led the following year to the founding of the Museum of Modern Art. A scholar, writer, and outspoken critic, Kirstein authored more than 500 articles, poems, reviews, books, and essays on the visual and performing arts, history, and literature. He founded the Dance Archives at New York's Museum of Modern Art, 1940, as well as Dance Index Magazine, of which he was editor from 1942 to 1948. His many honors include the Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Arts. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us to honor this distinguished citizen of New York. You are here, your history happened. Thank you.